It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. What's up? What's happening? Welcome in to Take Command. That is Logan Paulson. I am Craig Hoffman. And in just a moment, we'll be joined by Mike Golick Jr. Of course, Gojo and Golick on the Draft Kings Network. He's a college football analyst as well. Uh, played O-line at Notre Dame. Uh, I said all that, I think, in the intro to uh, Mike Logan. We just got, actually got done with the conversation. That's how this works sometimes. Uh, but I feel like I feel like we enjoyed that quite a bit. Yo, he's fantastic. Like he's just super energetic and gregarious. And I don't know what I was expecting, but you know, he comes from like this lo- like long line of like radio personalities, TV personalities, and that comes across. And his passion for football is pretty fantastic. So I, I came out of there just being like, wow, like dude loves ball and dude loves to talk. Like he's perfect for what he's doing right now. So that's awesome. Yeah, I remember talking ball with him at the Super Bowl um, and just being like, wow, like, yeah, he's the radio guy. And because obviously his dad, uh, you know, hosted uh, mornings on ESPN radio, Mike and Mike for 20 years. And then, uh, you know, Mike was a part of that show at the end before they they split and ultimately now are doing their own thing together uh, on the DraftKings network. But I, and you think of like all the fun bits and all the all the wacky stuff they did, um, which was great. It's the show I, I honestly grew up on. Um, but I uh I got done talking ball with him. I was like, oh, this dude like really, really knows ball. And so right. pleasure to have him on the show. And uh, we're going to talk some O-line with Mike slash we already did. And uh, here's that conversation. Our guest today is Mike Golick Jr. Of course, you can watch him uh, with his dad on the DraftKings Network, their awesome show. Uh, you might have seen uh, Mike also with me out in Vegas on Radio Row. Mike, I feel like we must be more rested for this than we were for that. Yeah, we have uh, set the bar criminally low if that's our baseline for existence. So, yes, feeling a lot more rested and recovered now that we've put some distance between us and Vegas Super Bowl, only in time to start hydrating now for New Orleans Super Bowl next year. Yeah, Mike <laughs> Logan, Mike was literally my last guest of the week, and we were both hanging on by a threat. So that, bet, was, yeah. uh, that was a good time. Uh, Mike, of course, uh, p- played offensive line at Notre Dame. So we're going to dive into the O-lineman. Uh, a bit today. And, and I guess kind of the big question around the O-line and the commanders is how aggressive do they get in terms of going back into the first round potentially from one of those picks at 36 or 40, as opposed to waiting for the kind of player that would be available there. So Mike, for you, like how deep is your top tier class of linemen? Cause I feel like that's the kind of the start of this question when we look at the 2024 draft. Yeah, I guess I would say looking at the guys that I would absolutely be like, man, if you got this dude in the first round, you would be a a home run threat. He would be a day one impact starter for you right now. I'd probably say that group for me looks like Joe Alt, uh, Olu Fashionu from Penn State. I should say Joe Alt from Notre Dame for those maybe uh, (laughs) unfamiliar there. Uh, Talisi Fuaga from Oregon State. Troy Fautanu from Washington I would throw in also in that group uh, Graham Barton out of Duke, whether you see him as a center or a guard. Jackson Powers Johnson, again, whether you see him as a center or a guard in there. And then I would say even the guys I would understand going in the first round based on potential would probably be Amarius Mims out of Georgia. J.C. Latham's going to go in that range too, who I also think would be good. And then from there, for me, it's probably a rung down where you get to Jordan Morgan out of Arizona, Tyler Guyton out of Oklahoma, Kingsley Sulamatia out of uh, BYU, Roger Rosengardner, guys like that. So I'd say my top tier probably ends with like, hey, you know what? I can get looking at Amarius Mims taking that dude where you would have to go probably back up into the first round. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing about that group is so. So to me, I, I totally agree with your group. I'd probably throw Tyler Guyton in there just for the Amarius Mims principle, where it's like you get this big athletic dude who's you know very hyper talented. But um, what's the difference in your estimation between that first group and that second group? I know the first group's probably like day one starter potentially, and then how long with that second group are you looking at a guy potentially starting for you? Because that's really the million dollar question for Washington at the moment, who's in desperate need of a left tackle. Yeah, I think for a lot of the rest of that group, you know, uh, Jordan Morgan probably uh, a little bit closer in that group, a guy that maybe it doesn't always look perfect technique-wise, yeah. but gets him blocked and is a big, you know, 
the classic dancing bear in the way he moves. Just a big, large, incredible athlete. Uh, Guyton in that range, too, and I think the discrepancy for me with, with him and Mims is just Mims, you can see a little bit more of the pedigree there. You can see the body angles. Technically, he's not super far off. It's just kind of like the same discussion in a, in a weird way we had around Anthony Richardson coming out of Florida where it's, hey, the bones are actually really good. Like This isn't just a big athlete playing the position. There's some stuff structurally in the way you build the house that looks good. He just hadn't played enough football, and Anthony Richardson obviously ran into that problem getting hurt. I think Mims is the same way, and Guyton probably is too. It's just he was doing things schematically at Oklahoma that I just think are a little bit outside his game. He's so long. He's so raw. And so I think in this day and age in the NFL, this all comes down to the question that everyone's got to ask themselves as a team is, do we have the offensive line coach capable of Mm -hmm. developing this kind of prospect? Because I think now – Everyone talks about the O-line problem. To me, it's just a, a time problem. You don't have as much time on field with these guys, and you need impact sooner. And so there's a premium paid on dudes that come out technically closer to ready. Guys that can go out there and start for you day one and aren't going to be overwhelmed by what they see coming at them from the other side while they're also trying to heart, you know, hone some of the parts of their game, hone some of the different parts of the most unnatural skill set on the field, offensive line and defensive back, back the guys that got to go backwards and block the best athletes on the planet. So I, I think those other guys, it, it, honestly, it depends on your coaching. If you're a place like the Tennessee Titans and you're bringing in, you know, Callahan, who's one of the best offensive line coaches in the NFL, you're allowed to move a little bit differently than most where, hey, no, you got a coach that's a kingmaker. This guy can absolutely get a guy that might be a little bit more toolsy than technique wise, ready to go in a hurry. Everyone else kind of has to be honest with themselves. And I think that's at times where teams run into trouble. So let me ask you both this on like a big macro question, because this will stun you. I don't know a ton about offensive line play relative to a lot of the rest of football, um, considering you both have met me in person. That's that's not stunning. Um, But we see a lot of these guys with the position flex. uh, You know, you mentioned Barton. He could play center. He could play guard. He could play tackle in the eyes of some people. But you also have a guy like Talisi Fuaga, who who, inside, outside, depending on who you ask. Um, But you even have a guy like Guyton, who's definitely a tackle, but he's only played right tackle. And if you're drafting a guy in the first round, often you're looking at a left tackle. Um, I mean, I, I know from like a sports performance standpoint, how you look at some of that stuff, but you know, having lived it, um, Logan is a tight end, Mike, you as a lineman, like how hard is it to move around and, and how much does that impact what you think of these guys as prospects? Yeah. I mean, I, I can just say like, you know, from being a rotational guy that had to kind of make a college career until I was a starter on being the guy that could play the inside three. And then when I got a couple of shots in NFL training camp, like part of it was moving out to tackle when I was in Pittsburgh. Certainly it's moving around along there. It's a really difficult transition. Zach Martin did such a disservice for this when he came out of Notre Dame and went from left tackle to right guard, because having to flip everything like that in your head is something not everyone's capable of. I think it's super individual. And so Uh, you know, uh, Logan, I don't know how you see it there, but that's something for me that, you know, you love to see if you're going to take a guy like Joe Walt's a good example. People are worried about the Chargers potentially taking him because they've got Rashawn Slater there. Well, Joe had a bunch of reps that, you know, tackle over getting down in a right-hand stance, game reps against NC State, against Ohio State this year, which also means he did it in practice, which is more than most guys that are top 10 draft pick studs at those positions usually have. So you've at least got something to go on there. For everyone else, though, it's going to be a lot about a guy's individual aptitude. No, I totally agree. I think it is, uh, you know, people say it's like throwing a baseball like with the wrong hand. I don't know if it's that extreme, but it is It is very, very challenging. You know, as a tight end, like you have to get in multiple stances and do different things. And even in that context, there's more, com- I feel more comfortable pass setting with my left foot in front, like just from a left footed stagger. Like there's guys that are going to have those individual kind of quirks and nuances. I think, you know, like with a guy like Tyler Guyton, however, I look at the athlete and I say to myself, he is so raw. Like he's kind of like a ball of clay, right? It, in some ways, it's a benefit if you're trying to move him around the front because it's like you don't have any bad habits. And I think the athletic profile there is something that gives you a lot of confidence. And again, it's a little bit of a gamble. You know, it's like some guys take to it really well. Some guys look awesome and some guys can't do it. And it's like, you know, I'd feel more confident if Bill Callahan was my offensive line coach. You know what I mean? And I think the other thing I'd look at too is just how they're being repped in practice. Like I've over the course of my career, college, NFL, and I'm sure Mike can speak to this too, is there's coaches that demand, even if you're the guy, 
that you play multiple spots in the offensive line. Like you, like, oh, hey, the second group's in, or you're going to play, you're the left tackle, you're going to play right tackle this series. And so if at Notre Dame, for example, they're really dogmatic about making sure there's a pretty consistent rotation, I feel very confident about certain guys making it. But again, that's stuff that is part of the scouting process, understanding the character and understanding what the system that they're coming from. So um, I, I totally agree with Mike. It is very individual, but there are certain qualities that you say, well, maybe that this this works for this individual specifically. So. Yeah. Mike, do you have anything to, to tack on the end there? No, I, I think all that's spot on. And I think the point about – and that's kind of what I always go back and forth on in my head is, hey, if you get a guy that's young without a lot of reps and is pretty raw, do you want to err on what he's most comfortable with because he's still learning? Or do you take that time and say, hey, mm -hmm. if I've got a good teacher and we've got a great athlete here – he's going to be able to absorb that better than most. And I, I tend to side with the latter on that. I do think that's kind of the way I look at it is, hey, if you've got a guy that doesn't have a ton of starts under his belt, is more of that ball of clay, then you take your opportunity as opposed to, you know, some teams are going to flirt with, hey, are we going to take a vet and try and move him over on the other side? It's like, that guy could potentially have hundreds, maybe more snaps <laughs> of game reps wired all in that way at the NFL level. And that's the last thing you'd want to mess with because, it's the thing all the time you see in offensive line play where a guy gets hurt and they'll bring in a guy who's a backup rotational player, but instead of putting him into the spot where you had a guy hurt, they'll move somebody else who is a starter to that spot and they'll put him in the spot he's most comfortable in. Now you've made two positions worse as opposed to just having one position that you've got to guard here. And I've always thought that that's kind of a suboptimal way to do things. And so this is kind of the same case where, hey, if you had a young guy that you can make a little bit uncomfortable as opposed to taking your vet and making him a little bit worse too, that's probably the route you want to go. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to ask, because I think that's 100% right, I think the other thing I wanted to ask is, like, of that second tier of guys, you know, the Guytons, the Jordan Morgans, the Kingsley Sue Matias, Patrick Pauls, Kieran Amadigi, Roger Rosengart, who in that group do you think is the most ready to start at left tackle right now? Because, like, I have my thoughts on this, and it's probably a little unconventional, but like you said, all those guys feel a little bit projecty. so. Yeah, I'll, I'll do, like... I would probably, and like talking to guys that I trust, like I'm probably a little lower on Guyton than most. The answer is probably him in terms of what you want, yeah. just because the tools are so ridiculous and he is such a great athlete. Like you count on, hey, you're also coming from a program. Like I don't want to slight, like we've talked about pedigree here. Uh, Bill Biedenboe and that Oklahoma offensive line program, that's pedigree. There have been quality dudes that have come out of that program. That's been a Joe Moore Award winning group for the offensive line in college. So there's certainly, you know, stuff that you can hang your hat on from that bunch. But it probably him, maybe, maybe Jordan Morgan too, because again, I think the premium is always just get him blocked. And he's a guy that can do that with some credit, some incredible size and athleticism. Yeah, a guy that I, another guy that I just want to run by you is the Roger Rosengarten. I know he played right tackle, but when I watch him, I think his foot dexterity is pretty fantastic. And I think like one of the traits when you're looking at offensive linemen, or at least when I look at offensive linemen, is like, how are your feet? And, um, you know, if you don't have the length, do you have the feet? And like Amarius Mims, like you talked about, is this is this guy with tremendous length and he, and he kicks well, but his feet are kind of slow, but it all works because of his frame. And I think Roger Rosengardner works the other way. His feet are so good, it makes his frame work. Do you think he could make the transition to left tackle? I know he played a little bit early at UW, but I just want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, Roger's interesting just because I, I, I'm curious. Like, I know he's had a little late surge. Mel Kuyper had him sneak into the first round in his latest mock, and I, I loved him. He was so interesting to study opposite Troy Fautana, who I think's quite honestly, best days are at guard or even center. I've been yeah. talking about that with a lot of people. Troy Fautanu at center, to me, looks like a future all-pro. Everywhere else, I think, can be a very good player, but I'd love to see him all the way down and inside and get snapping. But him opposite Roger Rosengartner, both very good, like technically sound athletes. You mentioned the feet and stuff with Roger. It just gets a little bit high, and I do wonder going to the next level with that kind of anchor not being the biggest guy in the world, what that would look like against NFL quality rushers early on in his career. But I, I, he would be a guy that, like again, coming from that program, really good, well-coached unit in Washington there. Um, I, I think he could have a shot, certainly. At, he might be one I think ultimately you'd be able to get outside of the first round, but if you yeah. really felt the need, could certainly be a dude. All right, so I'm going to sports talk radio this up and we're going to play because I want 
You know, we're talking O-line. Mike's a sports talk radio veteran. Logan, you're clearly going to be the most uncomfortable with this. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's also just a mock trade. So the, the, the question is, would you make the trade? Um, and I'm going to make it, let's say, 36 and 67. I'll go the richest, the richest version of this. Like, if you're doing 36 and 40, you better be trading into the, the mid-teens. So we're going to say this player, the players I'm going to name are available... I'll say I'll say 23 Minnesota um, presuming that they still hold that pick by then and they haven't made another trade uh, to get into the top five for a quarterback uh, but you're get you got to get in front of Dallas at 24 and so you're gonna package 36 and 67 which Washington has you're gonna go down from six top 100 picks to five uh, top 100 picks to do this would you do it for the following players uh the first one since there seems to be the biggest disagreement here is is Tyler Guyton. Would you make that trade? Uh, Mike, I'll let you go first. I would probably not. Yeah, so for me, I think the thing with Tyler Guyton is if you want him, I think you have to get to 23 because I think one of those next four or five teams will probably take him. And again, like Mike alluded to it, like he's very raw. He's very inconsistent. There's But the athlete, the frame, all those things, like there's, uh, there's a reason. Like there's only a couple guys on the planet Earth that look like this. I... Would definitely consider it. I would have to have a talk with my offensive line coach about whether he thought he could get him there, quite honestly, like to Mike's point. But um, like in terms of the athlete, in terms of the length, in terms of the mentality, watch him at the senior bowl. It's something I would definitely consider, but it's not an emphatic yes from me. Like if, if we were talking, hey, man, interesting, 27 to 35, like or 27 to 32, like I'd be like, hell yeah, let's get that done because I think he's going to be that much athletically better than the guys we just talked about. But um, but it, it is that is a little bit of rich for a guy that I think is on the fence in terms of whether he's going to actually hit in terms of offensive line play or not. Okay, interesting. I, Logan, I thought that was going to be a hundred percent yes for you, uh, but that's <laughs> that's uh, a definitive maybe, uh, which is honestly right up your alley. That's how uh, I, that's but, how I do stuff. Just maybe's, <laughs> man. Just we're just playing the just, fence the whole time. Just maybe's. This one I feel like is going to be more definitive. Marius Mims. Mike, you want to go? I, I think I know your answer. Probably, I, I would. Yeah. I, yeah, I just think you don't get 340 pounds that looks and moves like that very often. And again, like I think he's just a, like a math problem. I think you just have to get him more reps because a lot of the rest of it was there. The Georgia offensive line, the way it changed when he was out of that game and they had to kick Xavier Truss out to right tackle and kind of mix up the bag, it was noticeable for a guy that just hadn't even at that point played a ton of football. But again, like. Bends really well for a guy that size, moves really well for a guy that size. He's just got to get more consistent with a lot of things. But I would trust him if I'm going to take one of the guys that's a little bit more on the traitsy side and say, yeah, that dude's a little bit closer and I think I can get him there. Yeah, I mean, that's 100% yes for me. And I think just because he, I think when it's all said and done, he might be the best guy in the class. And I think when, again, when you look at the Ohio State game, when you look at the Alabama game, like it looks like it's, I've said this before, it looks like you're watching a high school football game and there's that one kid who's going D1, yes. right? He's just physically <laughs> better than everybody. And it's like, he's kind of sleepwalking, like his technique's not always perfect, but he's just bigger, stronger, faster. Like seeing him at the second level, like put hands on linebackers and just eject them. You're just like, this is very unique. It's kind of like watching Dewan Jones last year a little bit from Ohio State. You're just so big and you're just so skilled and athletic and you understand the angle so well, like you're going to be fine. So I think the one thing that gets me a little bit concerned, nervous is you hear things like he's a little, he's younger prospect, immature guy. Like how does he kind of mature and develop as an NFL player? But in terms of what you see on film, even though it's only seven games, like I, I'm not kidding. Like there is a universe and it's a very plausible universe where he's the best offensive lineman coming out of this class. So I think if you're going to take a shot, you're going to play the lottery, like might as well play with that guy. So, yeah, the character stuff's interesting with him because you hear that, but you also see like Dane Brugler has in the beast, like some really, really high compliments from some of his teammates. So the right. teammates speak really highly of him. Um, sometimes you wonder like how, uh, how company line trained they are coming out of college, especially a place like Georgia. Um, you know, how, how, how trained up media trained does Kirby smart have them? Um, but ultimately, you know, the, like the center, I think from Georgia had some really nice things to say about Mims. All right. So two guys I'm going to put out there kind of together for the same reason. It feels like Talisi Fuaga, there's no way he falls that far. Um, but Barton, I'm going to put him as well for the reason that a lot of people like don't know if they're actually tackles. Fuaga, there's a lot of people that say that dude's a guard. Now, it feels like he's a top 15 pick as a guard anyway, so probably not a, a thing. But if you're Washington and you need a tackle, specifically you need a left tackle, if somehow those guys fall, are you interested in them to play tackle? 
Mike, you want to go? Sure. Uh, I, I would say for Talisi, super interested in him playing tackle. I, I think he'd be a one. Obviously, a lot of his ball has been over on the right side there, but just a road grader. And you want to talk about like incredibly technically sound, looks the way it's supposed to. Sometimes the change of direction leaves a little bit to be desired. That might be my one concern with edge athletes, and it's why I think if you got him at guard, man, you got a home run. But if you got him at tackle, I think you still have a really solid starting player there that you can plug in pretty close to day one. On how he would handle the flip like we talked about is everybody else's thing. Barton, I, I really think he's got to be an interior guy. I thought he held up really well against some of the quality edge guys that you saw around the ACC. I, I think his lower body bend, his core strength, all this stuff gives him a chance anywhere. But I really think if you were going to want him in as a day one starter, inside is probably where you want, want probably where you want him to end up. Prefer him. Center would be awesome, but I think he could absolutely play guard with what you've seen him do, like largely out of a two point stance. Like you guys yeah. know this, you shouldn't be able to generate the kind of power you see that dude kind of consistently do coming out of a two point stance all the time, the way he often had to do it, Duke. Yeah, I mean he's he's incredible, you know, and like honestly, like with with Barton, I know like Washington doesn't need an interior player necessarily, but he just feels like the most get on base type of prospect out of this like first round group. Like you are going to get a good player, whether it's at guard, I mean maybe right tackle on a pinch, guard center, either guard spot. Like I love his film, and if and if Washington needed a guard, I'd say yeah, trade up and get him because he's the best guard in the class by a mile. Felicity Fuaga, I'm doing backflips. I, again, I don't think. I don't yeah. think he's going to be there necessarily, and I do worry about the switch with him from right to left. Um, but in terms of just a good physical culture-setting football player, like I think that's what you're looking at there. And then we'll figure out left tackle in free agency after the draft is over. But if he's there and that's the option to trade up for him and go get him, like he he is maybe my most favorite player in the draft just because he attacks the game with such violence. Like He's getting personal foul penalties, not for dumb stuff, just for being – overly aggressive and I want that guy in the building to kind of set the tone and set the roadmap for this organization so uh yeah I'd trade up for him in a second Graham Barton also if that was a need for the Washington commanders so yeah, for what it's worth, those are like you. We, we all go through and we talk about draft prospects, and you try and study as many of them as you can. There have not been two guys whose tape I have enjoyed yeah. watching more than Talisi and more than Graham. Like those were like genuinely fun to sit and watch the way that these guys approach the game for all the reasons Logan mentioned. So that's yeah, an easy one, minute. Craig. You just might not yeah. get like I mean, it just doesn't fit yeah. a need necessarily. But they're good football players. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Fuaga is the kind of guy where like if he's falling into the twenties because everyone's like, oh, he's a guard, not a tackle, and that's the value. You just go, well, screw you guys. Like we're gonna trade up anyway. And if, if he becomes our left guard, like they kind of. I mean, I know they signed yeah. Nick Allegretti, but all due respect to Nick Allegretti, if you can get that guy, might might mess yeah. around with that. I'm guessing uh, Fashanu, you guys would both trade up for as well. Yeah, I, I I do. I would. I, I th Olu's draft journey from last year to this year has been fascinating because there were a lot of people that thought if he had left last year, he'd have been the first tackle off the board. He probably would have been a top five pick. And now we've seen, you know, the Joe Alt conversation I knew was coming this year, but I didn't see him getting lapped. Like J.C. Latham being up above him was surprising yeah. to me because this is a dude like – the nightmare scenario I've envisioned for the rest of the league is if Olu makes it down to like, what, uh, where does Philly pick? 17? No, if he gets uh, they're, down, they're like 21. I 21, think. 22, sorry. Uh, yeah, 22, 22. Yeah. If he gets down to 22 and Philadelphia yeah. gets a hold of that guy, it is over. Done. Because that is probably, you talk about the ceiling for these guys, I think that's the most explosive lower body athlete in this offensive line class. Like, you watch the thing his lower half is capable of doing. It gets him out of so much trouble when his hand strike can get a little bit inconsistent at times. But I think he is so sudden, so twitchy. Had a couple of rough games against Ohio State that kind of scared people off, and or like a game like that against Ohio State that scared people off this last year. But again, I think if you just get everything tightened up a little bit there, like, there's a guy whose profile has a really, really high ceiling to it. I have a, like a nerdy football question. Can I ask Mike Craig, or is this going to kill the show? It's going to no, kill the game. This is, I mean, this is the best. <laughs> that's what this podcast is. Yeah. It's, hey, Craig, get out of the way so Logan can do the super nerd. Thing. Just ask. ask so, so okay, so I like I like him a lot as a prospect. I agree, he's very twitched up athletically. But I think when you watch him, there is a 
I don't say he's an external rotation of the hips, like a like a he's a waist bending kind of athlete, which makes me concerned long term about his ability to set the bull and his long term about his ability to be productive in the run game. You mentioned Graham Barton, just how bendy he is in his lower half, how he can uncoil his hips. I don't see that same type of strike from the hip standpoint from Fashano. Now, if you think that's a technical correction, I'm 100% on board. If you think that's just kind of how he's built, like I think his ceiling is much lower than people want to give him because, of, because of, again, that ankle tightness, that kind of hip tightness, he's, a, he's like a long-limbed lower half kind of guy, right? So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that because I like him. But I see some of that movement stuff in terms of ability to generate power into blocks. Because again, his movement stuff is great. His lateral quickness is awesome. His ability to get to second level is great. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out to you and say, hey, Logan, that's dumb. Or hey, I see it too, kind of thing. So No, I think like we're all going to fine tooth comb a lot of these guys, yeah. especially on the high end when it's a multi million dollar investment. And that's the kind of stuff, you know, a guy like Duke Manningweather who does a great job training up all these dudes, so good at identifying a bunch of those things and seeing that. That being said, for me, the concerns are a little bit more minimal there. Like mm. I, I think the thing he always does to me in the run game that seems like easy is just gets square on guys and gets his knees in the dude. Like everyone always has that like hip roll thing as their sort of like totem in the run game of, oh, you got to roll your hips through. I was always taught more of like a get your knees into guys and he mm. just gets on to guys, gets latched on and just finds a way to move them. Like he's a point A to point B guy on his best days. I think there, you know, maybe some of it could be scheme specific and what you're asking him to do, but I think just between that and like the basketball player feet that you get in pass pro, like so much of offensive line play is just how can you recover when things go wrong? It's what I think is Zach Martin's defining trait as an NFL offensive lineman is even when things go wrong, there's a part of Zach that's going to make it right. He's the ultimate recovery offensive lineman. And I think Olu's lower body has a little bit of that to it, where even when his upper gets out of control a little bit or gets him in trouble, he's so fluid as a mover below the body that I think it offsets some of those other things just because, again, he can get you out, get himself out of a jam sometimes. And that to me is really, really, I, I won't say undervalued, but it's very important. No, I agree. I think the feet are excellent. He's probably got the best feet in the class, quite honest. Him or I think Troy Fontenu, right, from UW, probably both in like that really amazing feet type of area. Yeah, Troy, Troy, like as far as a lateral mover, yeah, like especially like pushing to the spot, Troy is great. My worries yeah. for him come against longer, stronger athletes where sometimes it doesn't look like the lower body strength is always Correct. there as much. Right. For edge guys, like you watch those, you know, the freak shows they trot out at Oregon, although how long and strong every rusher is there. Every once in a while, you'd see Troy ending up on the ground, and I think in large part it was because kind of had to compensate once he got to the spot and maybe mm. didn't have, you know, as someone that lacked lower body strength that was in the <laughs> scouting report, every once in a while I can look up and I'm like, Oh yeah, I kind of I know what that looks like a little bit every <laughs> once in a while. So you know, obviously not to that extent where we're grading on a curve here relative to a guy that talented. But it's why I do think more of him at like Garter again. I, I'm I'm trying to say it publicly as much as possible because <laughs> Troy Fautano at center it, it kicks so much ass. I talked with Nate Tice about this over uh, at the Athletic, and he kind of offered it up too, just because even when you look at him his stance, he's squared off like an interior guy, but. He is so, so, so fluid on the edge. I can understand why, especially post-combine, people fell in love with that dude, seeing the way that he moved around in shorts. I feel yeah. like uh, every single guest we have right now is so incestuous. Like, <laughs> we've had Nate, we've had Mina. Mina's <laughs> talking about Nate. You're talking about Nate. Then you'll have Mina on. And then we're just over here like, hey, you guys want to talk about the commanders? Uh, <laughs> which, which does leave one question left, Mike. Hard left turn, or perhaps uh, more accurately, like uh, one to four yards back, depending on whether or not we're in shotgun. Uh, if you're the commanders at two, who would you take uh, on, on the quarterback uh, side of it? I would take Drake. Uh, I've been steadfast on this. Like I almost like to think of my pre-draft takes as like a time capsule and put them in there and then come to the end after we've done everything else, barring like major character concerns or an injury thing you find at the combine and go, all right, what did I think about this guy as a football player when we got started with all this? And is there any reason why that would have changed? And my initial read of this class was there was a top tier of two guys. It was Caleb Williams and Drake May, who I said could have been more 1A and 1B because I think their games have a lot of real similarities to them, even if Drake is the superior physical prospect really amongst this whole draft in terms of size and measurables and all that stuff that you can quantify. And so uh, I would take him there. I, I understand the arguments for Jaden Daniels and appreciate them, but uh, just for me, Drake would be the guy I was most comfortable with. 
You really have talked to Nate a lot, haven't you? <laughs> I mean, Nate, I, I remember it was so funny watching this in college football season because I'm sure you guys noticed this too. Like when you watch a guy in college and like I'm getting ready to call games in college, so I'm watching what does this player do that makes it really hard for the other team to beat him? What does he do well for that? Not as much thinking like, oh, what's he going to do on Sunday? How's that translate? And so there's a little bit of like Rosetta Stone that goes on after the season where you got to retrain your brain to think, all right, what does this guy project like to the NFL? And – I figured, like I said to someone before the season, the Drake and Caleb conversation is going to come. It's probably sometime after the year. And then once USC lost to Notre Dame, it was all of a sudden like everyone just goes, all right, well, now USC is out of it. Let's start Nick picking Caleb Williams like we're getting ready for the draft in the middle of October mm. and November. And then that was when it all of a sudden started. And yeah, Nate planted his flag early on and said, I am Drake May number one overall guy. He has been steadfast on that. And I, I agree with a lot of what he sees there. I, I just think that's a guy I know – I think footwork and processing are the things that I see most people bring up there, but I, I don't know. I just did not see it enough nearly to say I would knock him below Jaden Daniels, who, you know, you've got some concerns about the frame there. Certainly, is he going to be more of a one read and go kind of guy versus what you'll get out of the other two prospects there? But uh, I, I just think that kind of size, what we've already seen from the arm and him do without a ton of help there in North Carolina makes me pretty optimistic. Yeah, I mean – and the thing, it's funny because we all see the same stuff. It's just, what do you value? And that's where we, you know, yeah. I think, we, I, I don't know where I am. I, it depends on the day. I was going to uh, say, are you guys, have you guys made like the strong argument for Jaden Daniels here? What's, and what's like the general consensus on Washington? Like who do people want? That's uh, that's the million dollar question, depending <laughs> on who you talk to, right? It's like, yeah. it's kind of, it's kind of like a microcosm of the national media, right? You got guys that are emphatically Jaden or emphatically Drake. Uh, and I kind of personally feel like they're all kind of in the same tier. And to me, it's more about kind of the ecosystem that Dan Quinn and the staff kind of develop here. You know, and if they like a guy, like, as you know, like you've been around coaches before. If yeah. I like a guy, I'm more invested in you. I'm going to do more to make sure that you work and you're successful. So, you know, like to me, I could, if they took J.J. McCarthy, I'd be like, great. Now, what are we going to do to make sure that this guy gets to where we think he can go? So that's kind of my perspective. But again, that's like total fence sitting and goes back to that maybe thing Craig was mentioned earlier. But yeah, I think I think it, depending on who you talk to in the fan base in the DC area, like you're going to get a very emphatic response one way or the other. I heard um, the one, I think one of the best points I have heard in the feather for Jaden Daniels and his argument was uh, Eric Galco, who's one of the directors of the uh, East West Shrine Bowl. Um, he was on uh, with Richard Johnson on Split Zone Duo the other day, which is an awesome podcast and a really fun conversation between the two of them. But he talked about the aptitude that Jaden has already displayed in college about how much better he's gotten at every stop along the way. He was a guy that flashed early that we all saw at ASU. And when you, you know, he, he said you, you talk to people around LSU and what he was able to do coming over there year one to year two with Brian Kelly and that staff. Like he's a guy that takes, you know, what you give him and the criticism and all the coaching points and actually puts them out there and improves on those things. And so I, I think, you know, you talk about the intangibles and the stuff that coaches like being that receptive to coaching where it's not only, yeah, you're going to take it and not have a bad attitude about it, but you're actually going to be able to apply that to your game is hugely valuable for anyone in any position, but especially your quarterback. So I thought that was a really interesting and well thought out argument for Jaden Daniels and what he's already shown you as a collegiate player. Yeah, I think that's that's why I've, I think I've found myself slightly leaning back towards Daniels is you go, OK, the jump is the big question. Why did that happen? Are you just 23 and dominating college football now because you're an older guy who's you've seen four years worth of it? And you go, no, he, he, he discovered VR and he put in the work and he took the time. And you're like, oh, you have aptitude. OK, cool. Mm -hmm. Like we can work with that. So. I think that's where I'm at, but ask me again tomorrow and I might have a different answer. <laughs> uh, Mike Golick Jr., uh, Gojo and Golick, you can catch it on the Draft Kings Network. Mike, always a pleasure. Thank you, sir, for your time, and uh, we'll have to do uh, more. Logan can ask you about internal hip rotation next time. We'll do, we'll do that in the I was going to say, uh, man, we're getting appearance. into like biomechanics in the here. Weeds. Hip in the weeds. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. This in is sicko weeds. stuff. I love it. <laughs> yeah, you and Kevin Clark go debate beers. We're going to do biomechanics <laughs> over here. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks again to Mike Golick Jr., a.k.a. Gojo, uh, for joining us here on Take Command. Uh, Logan, what would you make of the tears that he had? And and that kind of that question, we gamified it because you know, I'm me and Mike's Mike. Um, but, you know, we, we gamified it. But that really is the question the commanders are asking is like, okay, if this guy falls to 
21, where Miami currently sits, and you want to get up ahead of Philadelphia, or 23, where Minnesota currently sits, and you want to get up ahead of Dallas, who's worth it? And and obviously, that's going to depend on how much it costs as well. Yeah, I think that that was a really I, I like that segment. I like getting his take on that. I mean, I sl- I think I slightly disagree with him about the Tyler Guyton thing and the Amer- Mary Smith Mims thing. I think those guys are just so freaky. I think you got to kind of get up there. I, you know, he said, "Oh, I think you can get Guyton after that run." But I think if you're Philadelphia, for example, and you have um, Lane Johnson sitting at, like sitting there as your starting right tackle, and I think you you can draft Tyler Guyton there at 21 or 22, wherever they're picking. I think you're doing backflips because like that guy in that system with that offensive line coach under the tutelage of that group is just going to be another freak there. So as much as like you'd like to think that one of those guys will slip through the cracks, that's where you're just hoping, hoping that, you know, for example, a team just has a slightly higher grade on, you know, a receiver or a cornerback or a safety. And then one of those big freaks slips down into kind of, again, if you can get them at 25, that 25, 30, 35 range, I think you're, you're, you're feeling good about trading up, but I think it's going to be a tall list. So for me, I've tiered them a little bit differently. I've tiered them as Guyton in that first group, Mims in that first group, because like they're just, I think they're just too athletically gifted to, to pass up on. And I agree with his assessment that Amarius Mims is that dude from a movement standpoint, but he's only played seven games. Guyton's only played 14 games in his college career. Like they're so incredibly raw, but so incredibly talented. Like someone's going to take a shot. And I think that's where it kind of leaves Washington in the lurch. Like if you think, if, if, if like Mike, you believe that one of those guys could slip slip past that spot, I think you feel pretty good if you're Washington. If you're like me and you don't think anybody slips past, I think it's what is it, Craig? It's twenty to twenty five, where there's like a bunch of heavy O line teams in there. Do you remember? Yeah. So right now Pittsburgh's at twenty. A lot of people have them taking a center. Um, so that's like a, a popular uh, either JCJ uh, or it's JPJ Jackson Powers Johnson or. Um, you know, if he falls, uh, Barton from Duke, yeah. uh, that seems like his absolute floor is 20. Miami's at 21. They could definitely use some O-line help. Philly at 22. I, I Tyler Guyton replacing Lane Johnson feels yes. so ridiculously unfair. Um, yeah. And thus it will happen. Uh, Minnesota at 23, but there's a good chance that's not Minnesota at 23 right. because they're going to trade up. And so maybe that's the Chargers. Uh, and they certainly are in the O line mix. Uh, that has been Harbaugh's MO when he takes over somewhere is to revamp the O line. Dallas at 24, Green Bay at 25 could right. use uh, a left tackle with Bakhtiari moving on. Um, and then you're kind of clearer, uh, Tampa, Arizona, Buffalo, Detroit, Baltimore, San Fran, Kansas City to, to wrap up the first round. Yeah, and I think San Fran's probably looking for an offensive lineman. So I, I just don't yeah. see how of the Jackson Powers Johnsons, the Graham Bartons, the Marius Mims, the Tyler Guytons, they just get through that area. I just think they're too good of football players. I think their ceilings are too high. So I, like for me, I think you got to get above that group. And it is a little bit rich for me to get above them because, again, they haven't played a lot of football. But – like their upsides are tremendous. So like that's where that comes in. And I think the million dollar question for me is of the next tier, kind of starting at Jordan Morgan. And like you can get on this too, Craig, obviously. Like Jordan Morgan, yeah. Kingsley Sumatia, Patrick Paul, Kirian Amadeji, Roger Rosengarten. Can one of those guys start for you at left tackle by week six of this NFL season? And that to me is the million dollar question. Like, I like Kingsley Sumatia, very raw. I like Patrick Paul a lot, very technically raw, very physically gifted, kind of in that Tyler Guyton mold, but level of competition is concerning. Again, I love Roger Rosengardner from an athletic movement standpoint, but I thought Mike brought up a great point. Like, worry about his size, worry about how elite his anchor is. Like, those are big questions. And then Jordan Morgan, like, I think there is a movement element that gets you excited, but you say, is he ultimately a guard at the next level because of the lack of elite arm length? So, all of a sudden, you go from this group of offensive linemen where you're like, yes, these are all starting offensive linemen in the NFL to a bunch of guys who are like, these guys will play, but how good, like, what is their ceiling? Like, are they starters at any point in their career? And I think that's where this becomes a little bit more dicey for me. And I was trying to get him to kind of pin down who in that second tier he'd be in on. Because to me, you know, like Jordan Morgan, like while he's the start of the second tier, I don't think he gets by San Francisco. If they're looking for an offensive lineman, I think San Fran takes him at 31. You know what I'm saying? So like, even yeah. though he's second tier for me, like I think his value is such that they would consider taking him there. Yeah, so I think that when you come to second round picks, you're looking at two different kinds of prospects. You're looking at safe prospects with low ceilings or total boomer bust guys. We're like, right. this dude might not last in the league for five years, or this dude might be a really 
a hopefully high end starter. Um, but maybe even just like he could be a starter, but it's going to take a while. Cause if you're a day one starter, who's like a bona fide starter, you're a first round pick. That's kind of what the definition is. So I look at guys like Patrick Paul and I'm like, I'd rather take the big swing and mm. hopefully get a high end starter versus someone who's a little bit safer. Um, I think that then you have like, I, I, I don't remember if Dane Brugler told this to us or whether he said it on the athletic football show. Um, but I think he actually did talk about it with us because, um, it was specific to Washington. Like Kingsley Suomati is really interesting. A lot of people have him up in that first bottom of the first tier or uh, above Jordan Morgan to start the second tier, but he transferred from Oregon to BYU to be closer to family. And if yeah. you're Washington and you're like, I don't trust that dude to move across the country and, and on a human level, be able to kind of survive as a, a pro as a 21 year old he's not like he's he's red flagged he's off your board yeah and so there there's those kinds of things that we just don't know that i think make this really really hard which i also i mean if you have anything to react to there i then have kind of a follow-up question too as you you look at this in a little more depth yeah and i think the kingsley sumatai just is a case study is really interesting because i've talked to a couple of my own line buddies around the league and it's always interesting talking to those guys because like they just have such a vast like vastly differing perspective on them, you know, and I have my own personal perspective. I like him. I like the upside, but ultimately I don't have to coach him. And so when you get guys saying, Oh, I don't, right. I'm not really that stoked about coaching him for whatever reason. And, and with O-line coaches, it could be a myriad of things. Like he puts Mayo on whatever, you know, like it just, like they just have weird reasons for not liking guys, but other guys are like, man, I think he could be the next dude. And I think that's like kind of what to your point, like those meetings, how you relate to the guy, um, you know, we were talking about Johnson and kind of what he did in New York off air before the show started. And I think one of the things is like, if, if Johnson likes him and thinks he can get him there, then I would say go that direction over a guy like Patrick Paul or over a guy like Roger. Ro like, I think Roger Rosengarten is a starting tackle in the NFL tomorrow. Like I'm very high on him, but it's like you were saying, Craig, his ceiling is like, Maybe that's all he is. Maybe yeah, if he's, he starts, but he's the twentieth best tackle in the league for his whole right. career. Like is that, a guy that's worth signing to a second contract, probably not. Right. It's it's like it's like he's uh, he reminds me a lot of Wiley. Right. He's got good feet. He's got some kind of suboptimal length. A good football player. A guy that I like. I think Wiley, for all of his bumps and bruises, had a pretty solid year last year. I think he could be that type of player. But as a second round guy, are you like super stoked about that? No. You want to take. Right. Patrick Paul, and you can always upgrade. Like that's the yes. thing with Andrew Wiley. Like he's good, but he's going to lose and lose fast often enough that you're like, we can do better than this if we invest properly. Yeah. And I think that's ultimately what you're looking at there. And it, it was kind of the same conversation you were having with Sam Cosme for a while, right? Sam Cosme was a yeah. good right tackle, fine right tackle. Like you're saying, maybe not top 15, but a guy you're kind of looking to upgrade on, you move him into guard and you're happy. Everyone's happy. So I think like that's kind of the landscape you're in on. You're in with these guys that have incredibly high ceilings, like your Kingsley Sue Matias, your Patrick Pauls, and then guys with tremendously low floors. And we haven't even talked about Kyrian Amadiji from Yale, like a guy who physically is very, very impressive. I think he's 6'5", 230, 225. He's got 35 inch arms, like looks the part, but it's playing at Yale. 325, not, not 225. Yeah, 325, excuse me. But he's playing at Yale. And no offense to Yale, but he's playing Dartmouth and he's blocking a guy who weighs 210 playing defensive end. So, like, it's just not fair. And, like, I, I had a conversation with a guy in the NFL and I was like, I don't want my dude's first, like, significant game in front of more than 25,000 people to be in the NFL. Like, I don't want that to happen. And so he's like, I'm going to steer away from that because he's more developmental than you want. So, it makes to me that conversation you keep bringing up about trading back into the first round so much more relevant because I have so much more, so many more questions about this second group of guys. I think they can all, they can all be good football players, but I, the, the doubt is so much less with that top, top bunch of guys. So that leads to my follow up question. Uh, you led me back to, to where I was, which is, 36 and 67 theoretically gets you somewhere in that 20s range. So like, oh, I just had a chart up. Where did it go? Uh, I feel like all I've done oh, for no. the last two weeks is uh, open and close this, these draft charts. Um, okay, so pick value chart. Uh, it's one of the old history. Open, recently closed tab. Uh, so the 36th pick is worth... 540 points on this chart. And no, I do not know which chart this is. I apologize. Uh, but the 40th pick is worth uh, 500 points. So five plus 540 is 1,040 points, which 
basically gets you the 15th pick on even. Now, uh, we did a great segment with Sam Fortier about a month and a half ago, probably on the radio show, where he talked about, like, you can't just create even on both sides when you do these charts. It's not how they actually work. The GM that's giving up the higher pick gets to basically win the trade. So really, your 1040 total might get you to the late teens instead of the mid-teens uh, by the time you calculate the loss, uh, if you will. I don't know why that's the case. It's like, just then weight the other picks higher. Anyway, yeah. so that's that's that. If you do 36 and 67, which is what I offered for you and Mike to get back theoretically into the high 20s, you've got 540 points from 36, uh, 255 points from 67. So that gets you 795 points. Uh, which doesn't get you actually, God, if you can get up to like 23 for that, actually, no, that's about right. Uh, 760 is 23. So we're talking maybe 23, probably somewhere closer to that 26 to 32 that you've been talking about where you're giving up that high third round, or maybe you could give up 78 instead uh, with 36 or 40. This is a long lead up to like show the work to this question. If I tell you, you can get to 18 instead of 21, 23, 24 and you can get to 18 whether that is for like i mean i guess a mims or someone would be really really interesting there that's like yeah. super sharp border but like let's say latham falls do you do that and try to get into the teens and give up 36 and 40 and then you have you have two firsts but no seconds i think washington's in a very unique position here because you're not looking for the best offensive lineman available you're looking for the best player that can also play left tackle which is a very kind of narrow window to be hitting, right? Because like I like J.C. Latham a lot. I think he's going to be a good pro, whether it's a guard or tackle, much like Tlisi Fuagu. Fuagu going to be a good pro, whether guard or tackle, right? The problem is they got to play left tackle. And so like when you look at left tackles traditionally, they tend to be a little bit more athletic, a little bit longer, a little bit more dexterous. Those guys don't really fit that bill, right? And so you know, some people say uh, Troy Fontenot. I'm kind of in the borderline camp of like, I think he could play left. Let him fail at left tackle. And then move him to guard. Like I know Mike was like emphatically like he's a guard. Like shoot, like Actually, Mike's left. Mike's leading the center, the center, the breathing. center charge. Yeah, interior yeah. offensive line. Yeah. I'm a I'm a believer. Like let him try it. If it doesn't work, fine, move him to guard. So like maybe that's the type of player you're looking for. I mean, I I really think you're looking at a guy like Mims or Guyton. And again, I I mentioned my reservations about both those players, but that's kind of the stylistically what you're looking for. So ultimately that's a no then. Like I'm not giving up 36 and 40 for a, that big of a risk. Like I can't I can't give up two potential starters at 36 and 40 for a guy that is a I hope like that's my, that's where yeah. I would come down on that. It's like I'm not even if I can get him Mims at 18 for 36 and 40, like I'd rather have Patrick Paul and a starting corner or Patrick Paul and a potential starting edge or one of these receivers that falls. Like I would rather have, if I'm going to take a swing, I'd rather do it and have someone else that I think is a starter than give up the chance for both. It's different with one of the third rounders. I'm willing yeah. to do one of the seconds and one of the thirds, but if I got to give it those two seconds, I, eesh, I don't yeah. like that. I don't like it either. And I think the other thing that I come out of there thinking is that in addition to the Guytons and the Mims, who are these kind of very high ceiling guys, low floor type guys, like very risky prospects with incredibly high upside. Is if like a Fashano, I think that's a really good hypothetical. Like I do have my reservations about Fashano, but if he's there at 18, that might be worth it. You know what I mean? Because again, yeah. he's a little bit more consistent. He's played more ball. There are issues with his game, no doubt about it, but he's a young prospect. He's going to get bigger and stronger. Like Maybe that's the guy, and he does play left tackle. And in terms of like athletic left tackles, like Mike was very high on his foot speed. I'm very high on his foot speed too. Again, there's reservations about the physicality and the toughness and all that kind of stuff. But maybe that's the type of player you're trading up for if he does take a little bit of a slide, which is entirely possible. But again, it is a little bit of a, it's dicey because you're giving up a lot to get back into the meat of that first round to get ahead of that kind of 20 to 25 range of offensive line needy teams. So it's tough. And then then my next question is like, do you think Jordan Morgan is a starting left tackle in the NFL? And right. I don't have a good I, I don't have a great feeling about that because again, much like those other guys, very raw. And as the questions mount, you look at the physicality, you look at all these traits and you say is the o-line staff is the offense here much like a quarterback good enough to develop some of these prospects that are more 
technically raw. And that that to me is where the, the million dollar question comes in at 36 and 40 if you are picking an offensive lineman. Yeah, no doubt. And to me, the more it's also as the question stack, the less likely I am to to trade up because yeah. if if we're buying, if the draft is a lottery, I want more tickets. And that's right. that's ultimately kind of the, the overwhelming uh, philosophy here. All right. That's our show for today. Um, we have a banger for you to start next week. Uh, that is Charles Davis joining us for the entire show. Yeah, that's right. Charles Davis, NFL Network, CBS Sports uh, on on game day during the regular season uh, with my guys, Ian Eagle and Evan Washburn. Um, the great Charles Davis. We've been exchanging film clips with him via text message. Now we're bringing all that conversation to the podcast. Uh, and then we will wrap up our pre-draft coverage here on Take Command with one final mock draft the day before I head to Detroit for it. Uh, we'll also have kind of our coverage schedule for the draft and, and what to expect on all that uh, uh, coming up on the episode with Charles slash the mock draft episode. If depends on depending on when we finalize it. So Logan, we should, we should talk about that, we but should. not right now. Cause I have to go to a radio show. The show's over subscribe. Okay. Now the show's over. Thanks for watching this clip of take command, which has a brand new home. That's right. You can watch on YouTube at the Team 980. You can also listen to full episodes in the free Odyssey app, which is now enabled with Apple CarPlay. So we'll just, you know, follow you around. <laughs> <laughs>